Let us first discuss the outline of today's talk. We will start with a brief summary of what we have already learnt. Then we will look at some interesting reflection models followed by diffraction models and then scattering models. All three are important propagation mechanisms and must be understood if we have to come up with a realistic channel propagation model. First a brief recap as to what we have done. We looked at propagation basics last time, how the radio waves propagate scattering, reflection and diffraction in brief. Today we would like to go more into details, hopefully come up with a mathematical model which can explain how the propagation effects take place. We last time looked at certain properties of radio waves, then we went on to discuss certain antenna basics. We of course did some examples. Then we looked at the propagation mechanisms. Now continuing with the recap, we learnt that reflections occur when the electromagnetic wave impinges on an object which has a very large dimension as compared to the wavelength. So it is all relative. If I go into higher and higher frequencies that is have smaller and smaller wavelengths, I tend to have more reflecting surfaces in the same room. Of course, the big surfaces like the earth, the buildings, walls, the tabletop, etcetera, all form reflecting surfaces. The other methodology is diffraction, which occurs when the radio path between the transmitter and receiver is obstructed by a surface that has sharp irregularities, for example, edges. Normally, we may not have line of sight. However, we still get our radio signals. We can still talk sitting inside the room without a direct line of sight to the base station. So, diffraction is the methodology which explains how radio signals can travel in urban and rural environments without a direct line of sight. All this is important because if we do not understand the effects of reflection, diffraction, or scattering, we will not be able to come up with a good propagation model and hence we cannot theoretically test our systems. The third cousin is scattering, which occurs when the medium has objects that are smaller or comparable to the wavelength. Again, small and large is always with respect to the wavelength small objects, rough surfaces and other irregularities in the channel will call, cause scattering. If we just consider for example, very high frequencies above 10 gigahertz, then raindrops start scattering. As mentioned before, raindrops will form an impeding factor when we go into for example, IEEE 802.16, which will work at higher frequency ranges above 30 gigahertz. However, raindrops do not matter much at GSM frequencies. So, it is important to understand what causes scattering and how to overcome it. Let us now have a deeper understanding on how reflection works, specifically for radio signals. Reflection, as we have said, occurs when a radio wave propagating in one medium impinges upon another medium having different electrical properties. So, that is important. It may impinge on a dielectric, it may impinge on a conductor, I will have different kinds of reflection. But reflection will occur as long as there is a different electrical property in the other medium. If a radio wave is incident on a perfect dielectric, then part of the energy is reflected back into the original medium, whereas part of the energy is actually transmitted through the dielectric. Okay. A lot of materials in the room which cause reflections are made out of dielectrics, brick walls, uh, simple wooden table, all form part of the dielectric reflecting surfaces. 
the electric field intensity of the reflected and transmitted waves can be related by the Fresnel coefficient gamma. If the electric sorry the radio waves are incident on a perfect conductor, the entire energy is reflected back. This is important because if we have metal frames in the windows, a strong scattering effect and reflecting effect will happen from these metallic surfaces. So, metal conductors, building tops, surfaces which have metallic surfaces will form perfect reflectors. Incidentally, in our earlier lectures, we had talked about passive reflectors, where we use these passive metallic reflectors to reflect energy to the areas which are normally not covered. So, reflections may cause uh, difficulty in sending waves because it will cause multipath, but on the other hand it can also be used constructively. Polarization I would like to discuss in the next couple of slides, because in general electromagnetic waves are polarized. They have instantaneous electric field components in orthogonal directions in space. A polarized wave can be represented as a sum of two spatially orthogonal components. For example, you can have a vertically polarized wave or horizontally polarized wave or you can have left hand circularly polarized or right hand circularly polarized waves. If I have a vertically polarized antenna, then at the receiver I must have a similar antenna, otherwise I will not be able to get the entire energy. If I use a horizontally polarized antenna to recover vertically polarized beams, I would miss out on most of the energy. Of course, there is a notion of cross polar discrimination in which how good your antenna are will be described by this factor x p d or the cross, cross polar discrimination. Polarization can also be used as a degree of freedom for frequency planning. Last time we learnt that frequency is normally reused. However, if we add another parameter which is polarization, I can probably do better. I can actually use frequency, polarization, reuse pattern instead of only frequency reuse pattern. The idea is simple, for every frequency band, I have two options, either vertical polarization or horizontal polarization. So, just let us take an example, I would like to talk about LMDS, the local to multipoint distribution services, which can be used in conjunction with the IEEE 802.16, the wireless MAM standard. Here, I have shown a lot of square cells. So, this example is illustrative in the sense that I am using a different shape of the cell. Each cell is square in shape. If you look carefully, the red dots indicate the base stations. The square cells have a radius r and as you can see, I have marked each cell either by a v1, v2, h1 or h2. V implies vertical polarization, 1 implies frequency band 1, H implies horizontal polarization, 1 implies frequency band 2. So, H2 simply implies second frequency band horizontal polarization. So, in this diagram, I have four colors to color my map, V1, H1, V2, H2 and this is actually deployed in order to obtain frequency polarization reuse. Clearly, you will have co-channel interference, but this time the co-channel interference will only occur in the cells which have the same frequency band and the same polarization. You have just extracted little bit more by using two different kinds of polarizations, so just one of the uses. So, here for example, if I put a customer station C s, it is 
hooked on to its own base station. Please remember LMDS is fixed broadband wireless application, right? So it's fixed broadband wireless access. We are sitting here as a customer, but the antenna is on top of my house and this is a base station probably on top of a tower and I am focused at my base station. The other characteristic feature of LMDS is that it uses very low half hour beam width antennas at the customer station. So, instead of getting only energy from its own base station, it will also get some energy from the H1 which is farther apart. But look, the reuse has made the first co-channel tier almost 5 cells away. So, the simple use of polarization has allowed me to increase my reuse distance, thereby decreasing interference. However, there will still be some interference between H1 and V1, because H1 represents first frequency band, V1 represents the first frequency band with vertical polarization, here it is horizontal polarization. So, if the cross polar discrimination, the ability of your antenna to distinguish between vertical and horizontal polarization is not good, then you will also get some energy which is interfering energy from V1 as well. So, this is at a third tier, it is much closer. Typical values of XPD can be between 20 to 25 dB, so which is pretty good. Now, let us go back to our original issue of reflection from dielectrics, because a lot of the world that we live in is actually made out of dielectrics. Consider for example, this diagram. Diagram A is depicting a reflecting surface, which is a dielectric. There is an incident wave. I have broken up into two orthogonal components E i and H i. E i is in the plane of the paper. H i is orthogonal to the plane of the paper and it impinges on this surface with another dielectric. Part of it is reflected back as an E r and H r and part of it is transmitted as an E t. Okay. And here I have taken the other example where the electric field E is normal to the plane of the paper. Now, we were talking about the reflection coefficient, coefficient specifically Fresnel's reflection coefficient. So, gamma parallel is nothing but E r, the reflected E divided by E i, the incident energy is nothing but eta 2 sin theta t minus eta 1 sin theta i divided by eta 2 sin theta t plus eta 1 sin theta i. I will talk about what eta 1 and eta 2 are in a minute. The gamma perpendicular, which is E field normal to the plane of the incident is given again by E r over E i as expressed as eta 2 sin theta i minus eta 1 sin theta t whole divided by eta 2 sin theta i plus eta 1 sin theta t. Now, what is this eta? Eta is the intrinsic impedance, which is defined as eta i is equal to mu i over epsilon i. What is mu i and epsilon i? Mu i is the permeability and epsilon i is the permittivity of the dielectric. Given these things, you can actually find out the reflection coefficient. So, if you have a brick wall, you will have different values of mu i and epsilon i. If it is a wooden partition, you will have another values of mu i and epsilon i and so and so forth. The point is, you can have a deterministic model by virtue of which you can actually calculate the energy that is reflected off. Please remember, statistical models fail to hold good above 10 gigahertz. Above 10 gigahertz frequency, usually we have to resort to deterministic models, where we actually do something called as a ray tracing. We start from the transmitter, we trace a ray, look at the reflection diffraction and scattering of the ray until the point that it reaches the receiver. 
and we can calculate how much energy is actually reflected back by knowing the permeability and the permittivity of the dielectric. So, all this is important if you have to do any deterministic modeling. On the other hand, we also have sometimes perfect conductors or even good metals which will cause reflections. These are strong reflections. So, the problem is the electromagnetic energy cannot pass through perfect conductors. Therefore, they can be used for shielding. Fine. So, if I have to shield my a part of my circuit, I would rather cover it with an aluminum foil and I will ensure that energy does not leak to the other side, because all the energy is reflected back. Thus, we have theta i is equal to theta r, Snell's law, E i is equal to E r, which is the E field in the plane of incidence, E i is equal to minus E r, E field normal to the plane of incidence and your Fresnel reflection coefficients gamma parallel is 1 and gamma perpendicular is minus 1. So, for a perfect conductor, a metal, we have the following relation. Now, one of the important things that we encounter in mobile propagation is the reflection from the ground. This normally occurs when I do have a line of sight, but that is not the only way we get. We also get a reflection from the ground as well. So, in line of sight scenarios, the reflection from the ground is also important. How important we will soon find out. A two ray ground reflection model is often used. It is a simple model, but it is a useful model. So, we will understand what is this two ray ground reflection model. This model is reasonably accurate for predicting large scale signal strength over several kilometers. In fact, this model is good when the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is large. The assumption is that the height of the transmitter is about 50 meters or more. This is true for your mobile applications. So, let us look at this ground reflection model in greater detail. So, consider for example, a base station and your earth. The base station as we have said should be tall enough how tall? About 50 meters or higher. Typically, base stations are mounted on top of a tower or on a small tower on top of a building. We had discussed earlier that base stations are called so, because in earlier versions of the base station, the actual circuitry and other components and battery and backup was so heavy that they could not put it at the top of the tower, they put it at the bottom and hence the name base station. Only the antenna was at the top. Today, everything goes on the top. So, let us put a mobile station and the idea is to find out how the mobile station uh, receives signals from the base station directly as well as through a reflected path. But the first assumption is that the base station and the mobile station should be separated by a certain distance. The ground reflection model does not work when your mobile station is very close to the base station. So, let us put it slightly apart and let us see how the mobile station would like to set up its communication link with the base station. So, there is clearly a line of sight because there is no obstruction. So, which we depict by E L O S the subscript LOS stands for line of sight. However, that is not the only energy that we are getting. We will also have a reflected path, which goes, hits the earth and is reflected back. Not all the energy is reflected back, because earth is a dielectric. To simplify scenarios, I have put a horizontal line here and shaded it to make sure that it is forming a reflecting surface. Now, couple of things are important here. Firstly, the total received energy at the receiver 
is the sum of the line of sight path as well as the reflected path. But the sum just does not happen as a scalar sum. What we get is a phase difference because of the path difference. So, the addition is actually a vector sum which will result in a very different kind of a E total. The other important things is the height of the base station H of t as well as the height of the receiver H of r. We will see that both these parameters would play an important role in the amount of received power that you get. Of course, the distance must also play a role. So, if I have to move from this actual scenario of a base station and a mobile station and a ground reflection model, let us somehow remove that and put a more simplistic model. So, what I would like to do is to phase out the mobile station and the base station and simply put it as a vertical line for transmitter and a receiver and this is the model that you find in most textbooks. Distance d is between the transmitter and the receiver. Height of the transmitter h of t, h of r height of the receiver. Please remember this is the absolute height. So, if the base station is situated on top of a building, we take the height from the ground. If the car or the mobile station is sitting on a small hill, we take the height from the ground level. So, to carry forth the calculations, we just look at the method of images and how we can calculate the received power. The basic philosophy is that the total received power is the sum of E loss, E LOS and the reflected one. So, what is interesting to note is what will come into the calculation using this method of images is the relative height H T minus H R here. The idea is to first find out the path difference that will give us a phase difference and a time delay. Using these two parameters, we can actually calculate what is the net received power. So, the two paths that are important is a line of sight path, which we will depict by d prime and the reflected path, which we depict by d double prime. So, the path difference capital delta is nothing but d double prime minus d prime and can be found simply by geometry. And if you do this basic geometry, you find that the path difference, the path difference between the green line and the bent red line is nothing but 2 h t h r divided by d, the product of the height of the transmitter and receiver divided by d. Okay. Normally, h t is fixed. When we design the system, we fix the transmitter height and then the receiver height varies. If you go ahead and calculate the phase difference, it is nothing but 2 pi lambda, sorry 2 pi delta over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. So, phase difference does depend on the frequency and the wavelength. The time delay is given by delta over c, the speed of light is nothing but theta delta over 2 pi f c, f c is the frequency, carrier frequency. Now, based on the phase difference time delay, if you try to calculate the net power received at the receiver, after a little bit of algebra, you can show that the received power p r is nothing but the transmit power p t times g t, the gain of the transmit antenna times gain of the receive antenna times something very interesting h r h t divided by d square whole square. This is what is important. Because normally for your mobile station, the g r receiver gain you cannot do much. You have a fixed omnidirectional antenna. You cannot play with the receiver gain. You also cannot play much with the transmit antenna gain which is at the base station. Here I am talking about the downlink because that is a design parameter that you have calculated and fixed. What you must calculate 
and fix for your system is the height of the transmitter and height of the receiver if you are considering line of sight propagation. So, d square is there, but now it is d squared again raised to power 2, it is d to the power 4, it is still kind of free space propagation, I am not using any other path loss exponent, but this ground reflection is making my signal drop faster than natural, even in free space. It is important and this very simplistic model actually holds good in most mobile application at the GSM frequencies. It is a realistic model. Okay? So, it is important to understand this thing. Of course, if I give you the values of transmit power, the antenna gains and the height of the transmitter and receive antenna, you can easily calculate the received power. And received power will form the bottom line as to what should be your receiver sensitivity and also what is the amount of desired signal and interfering signal you are actually getting. This is good news for interference because the received power from the interfering base station goes as 1 over d raise power 4. Since the interfering base station is usually far apart, the interference goes down, but please remember as you increase the distance between transmitter and receiver, the line of sight condition ceases to hold. It is more difficult to find line of sight as you move farther and farther away from your base station. So, you must keep all these factors in mind. Now, let us move to the next method by which propagation takes place is diffraction. This occurs when the radio path between the transmitter and receiver is obstructed by a surface that has sharp irregularities or edges. Corners, edges, bends, all of these things will cause diffraction. Diffraction is very important because otherwise without a line of sight sitting in this room, I would not be able to receive any signal from my base station. Hence, this explains how a radio signal can travel urban and rural environments without a clear line of sight and diffraction can be explained by Huygens principle. What it says? All points on a wave front can be considered as point sources for the production of secondary wavelets, right? that is the Huygens principle and that still holds good for our case. Now, let us look at some models and try to explain how diffraction might work and then it will be used for our calculations. If you are actually going to use a deterministic model, then you have to put in diffraction models as well. So, let us look at something called as the knife edge diffraction geometry. Again, let us look at a realistic scenario. I have a transmitter and a receiver. This time, I have not said one as the mobile station and one as the base station, I just have a tower with a transmitting antenna and a tower with a receiving antenna. And you can consider it to be a point to point communication, microwave communication link or you can also con consider it as communication between two base stations or between the base station and the mobile switching center. Now, let us put an obstruction. So, I have to avoid the line of sight. Please note this time I have ensured that the two towers are not at the same height also. It could have been a hill, a building, a tower or any other thing. But in this knife edge diffraction geometry, the only assumption is that at the top where the diffraction is going to occur, you have a sharp edge. It is not a building with a flat top it could be a building with a thatched roof, so that there is an edge here. So, I, all I need is an edge at the top. So, there is no line of sight clearly, but still by virtue of diffraction signals being emanated from this first tower should somehow reach here. Okay. 
So, what I would like to do is radiate signals from my first tower and here is the um, radiation pattern of the receiver antenna which is trying to absorb whatever energy gets to here. Now, let us look at how things work. When you transmit from the transmitter T, you radiate in all directions assuming for the time being it is an omnidirectional antenna. Look at the wave specifically in this direction. The one that hits here will generate wavelets which will travel from all directions. From Huygens secondary uh, source principle, any point on the wave front will generate its secondary wavelets. So, one here, one here, one here and so on and so forth. But the ones which are present here will diffract and go and will be received at the receiver. So, even though there is an absence of a line of sight, I still get my energy here. In fact, a lot of communication in GSM bands occurs like this. It is usually not obvious. So, if we would like to make a model out of it, a knife edge diffraction model, let us look at how we can slowly phase this thing out. So, we can actually replace our transmitters, receivers and the building by slowly vertical lines and a knife edge obstruction. So, we move from reality to theory and this is my diffraction geometry for a knife, knife edge obstruction. Please note that the distance from the knife edge obstruction D 1 from the transmitter and D 2 from the receiver. Of course, the things which will be important is the height of the obstruction. So, what we would like to know is how much energy we get at the receiver having this geometry. So, what we would like to understand is what is the diffraction gain, right? because of diffraction we get some energy. So, first we define something as the fresnel kirchhoff diffraction parameter which is given by nu is equal to h under root in the numerator 2 d 1 plus d 2 divided by lambda d 1 times d 2. What is h? h is the height we saw last time between this line of sight and between the top of the knife edge diffraction diffracting obstruction. This is your h that is being used. d 1 and d 2 are the respective distances from the obstruction to the transmitter and the receiver, lambda is the wavelength. Please note nu is inversely proportional to the square root of lambda. Now, we will use this fresnel kirchhoffs diffraction parameter to find out how much diffraction gain is possible due to a knife edge. And these have been calculated by Lee and are being tabulated here. When nu is less than minus 1, the gain in dB is 0. Okay. Please note this is a dB, G subscript D stands for the diffraction gain. However, as we gradually get a larger value of nu, my gain increases okay. and then later it starts falling again. So, there is a sl slight hump and if you plot these diagrams, you will find that the gain increases and then goes down. What is important is this nu depends on the distance from your obstruction and the wavelength and of course, linearly proportional to the height. For greater than 2.4, one way to do it is to just increase the height this gain falls drastically. In fact, you can see an inverse relationship here. As you increase the height beyond a certain limit, you will get very little diffracted energy. This is intuitive also. Okay. So, I like buildings which are not very tall, they will help me 
get some good diffraction gain. So, using these we can actually calculate how much energy we will get after diffraction. Please also note that the wavelength figures in. So, the same building will diffract 2.4 gigahertz frequency band differently than 5 gigahertz band or 900 megahertz band. In fact, as you go to higher and higher frequencies, smaller and small wavelengths, this diffraction thing decreases in effect. Scattering starts becoming more important. Now, an objection could be raised that why do we consider the simplistic model of a single edge diffractor. Normally, there is not just one building, there could be multiple buildings. So, let us try to do that. This time, I have put a transmitter on top of a tower and a receiver again on top of a tower, but this time, they are at different heights. I am going to put not one, but two knife edge diffractors. So, here is tower 1 and here is tower 2. Now, the question is, will we get any energy being transmitted from transmitter 1 to transmitter 2? The answer is yes, thanks to diffraction, I will still get some energy here. It will go here and then because of the wave front, it will go to here and then there will be another wave front and then there will be wavelets which will go and received here. Let us look at it. So, you send some signals, it traverses this path and then here there is a wave front, from here I have a secondary wave which will go here. There are lot of other secondary, secondary wavelets that will come out, but none will go directly to the receiver and I am neglecting those. So, please remember this is not the only wavelet that is coming out, right? but this path will ensure that at least this ray thanks to the diffraction will reach the receiver. Okay. Now, the question is if we want to model this, I will like to replace the buildings by two knife edge diffractors. So, we are going from the single edge to double, but this is the geometry we are talking about. Now, very surprisingly the same geometry can be explained using a single knife edge or an equivalent single knife edge placed critically at this point. The position and the height of this equivalent knife edge will depend on the heights and the distances of the first two original knife edges. See, this is very interesting. We go from here, we first replace it by two knife edges, thank God we are getting some energy and then we discover that they can be equivalently replaced. In fact, the equivalence is so good that I would like to kind of phase out the other two reflectors and just focus on the single knife edge. But I have very good equations to explain single uh, knife edge ref diffractions. So, I can kind of represent the multiple knife edge diffraction using a single knife edge diffraction model. And same logic can be extended to more than two uh, knife edges. But please remember the problem to be solved is what is the equivalent height and the distance of the equivalent knife edge. Right? Now, let us look at the third method which is scattering. Scattering as we all know occurs when the medium has objects that are smaller or comparable to the wavelength. Small objects, rough surfaces, raindrops, other irregularities in the channel, dust, dew drops, all of them will cause scattering. Scattering will also be caused by foliage, for example. The moment we go to higher frequencies, our wavelengths become smaller and smaller and very soon they become comparable to the size of the leaves and suddenly the foliage becomes important. At GSM frequencies, 900 megahertz, 1800 megahertz, the 
propagation through trees is not a major impediment, but the moment you start going above 10 gigahertz, you face a problem. If you see a patch of green, a lot of absorption, scattering and diffraction will start taking place. It is important to have these effects in mind. Scattering follows the same principle as diffraction causes the transmitter energy to be radiated in many directions. So, foliage, street signs, lamp post, edges, all of them can cause scattering. So, let us now put in perspective the three techniques we have learnt and how they happen in real life scenarios. So, in a real life scenario for a change, I have put my base station on top of a building, because the system planner found out that this to be an optimal base station location, but there was an existing building. So, they are going to pay royalty to the person whose building it is, they will erect a small tower, I have shown a big tower here and put the base station on top. Okay. Many times the optimal base station locations are not open for purchase, then you have to put the base stations suboptimally. But putting base stations at proper locations itself is a science, it is an optimization problem, it is a resource allocation problem. What is the minimum number of base stations you would like to use to cover the maximum area? Now, in a real life scenario, I have some buildings and I have a transmitter. So, let us put a receiver here. And since it is a mobile receiver with a small antenna sticking out, it is free to move into this environment where there are buildings and there is a tower which is transmitting which is your base station. So, this receiver moves and it of course, has a height of its transmitter antenna. We have learnt that the transmitter antenna height and the base station antenna height are both important. So, let us mark them by H T and H R. Let us see what are the radio propagation mechanisms that will happen in this real life urban scenario. I have tall buildings, I have towers, I have a ground and there is a mobile station. First, I have a direct signal, I am lucky. Earlier wherever we started off with, there was no direct line of sight, but this time because of its position, it has a direct line of sight, great. But of course, that is not the only thing, it has a reflected signal as well. Now, this is not necessarily good news, more energy for once is not necessarily better, because the received signal will superimpose on the direct signal and will in effect cause destructive interference and might lead to something called as a fading. We will talk about fading effects in subsequent lectures. But reflection is not the only solution possible. So, there could be a diffracted signal as well from a from an edge, right. So, direct signal, reflector signal and diffractor signal, all of these are going together adding up vectorially to give the net signal received, which is very different from what was actually sent. Remember, all these paths have different time delays, different phases and different signal strengths, which add up to give you a net signal, which is very different from what you actually sent. What is important is the distance between the transmitter and receiver. Let us look at another scenario, this time from a bird's eye perspective. So, I am sitting on an aircraft. I am looking down on a city, which has some buildings and a street scenario. Let us look at how the propagation mechanism works in this scenario. So, there is a, a certain central space, where there is a small roundabout, maybe the police person can stand here and there are three buildings, or four buildings here. Let us put a transmitting antenna here. So, I am talking about somewhere, somehow a transmitter being communicating with another mobile station. So, it is a 
more of a walkie talkie scenario not the mobile scenario, but it still forms uh, falls under the purview of wireless communication. So, this transmitting antenna would like to communicate with this receiver. So, for a change no base station. Now, this receiver is free to move, it is a street, so it is a pedestrian traffic. So, this guy moves here. So, even though earlier they had a line of sight, now the line of sight has gone, but that does not mean this receiver will not receive any energy. First, it can get some signals through a couple of reflections, but note it is a reflection here, but here it is not a reflection. When you have an edge, it is usually a diffraction, fine. But even though you do not have a line of sight, you have another possibility of diffraction, the knife edge diffraction which is happening here. So, the point that I am trying to make is, it is not always that you have to have a tall building for that knife edge thing to work, it is a corner of the building which is causing a diffraction and this guy is still receiving energy, but that is not all because it can get some scattering effects from this point as well. It depends on the wavelength being used. So, in this simple scenario, we are looking at reflection here, diffraction at two places, please note we have to have an edge here and scattering. All three things are playing an important role. So, as a mobile moves through a coverage area, these three mechanisms have an impact on the instantaneous received signal strength, all the three parameters. Now, if we are lucky, if the mobile does have a clear line of sight, then diffraction and scattering will not dominate the propagation. The line of sight exists, have a clear signal strength. However, if a mobile is at a street level without line of sight, then diffraction and scattering will probably dominate the propagation. So, this is important, models exist for all of this, so it is possible to figure out theoretically and by simulation how much is the received power actually obtained and whether we can work at a good level. So, I would like to come to a summary at this point in time. The summary of lecture 9 is as follows, we looked at various reflection models, we looked at reflection uh, from a perfect conductor, reflection from a dielectric and we also found out that the gamma, the Fresnel reflection coefficient gamma parallel and gamma perpendicular. We then talked about the diffraction model, we talked about the single knife edge diffraction model and also the multiple knife edge diffraction models and we also saw, saw how magically you can uh, convert multiple diffraction models, the multiple knife edge diffraction models into a single knife edge diffraction model. We then also found out that scattering is there and can help you receive the signal without a clear line of sight. Then we also learnt that from basic scenarios, you can either have a line of sight, reflection, scattering or diffraction. So, one or more a combination of these will eventually get you the instantaneous signal and what you get is a vector sum of the various kinds of signals that you have received. Okay. So, we would like to conclude here and in the next lecture, we would go deeper into propagation models. Thank you.